Hallelujah. We love you guys. Brother Parrish and I were talking a couple of weeks ago, and I think we're going to do this uh, next week. Uh, I asked my dad if he would fill in for me. Uh, keep him straight, if you would. Thanks, Jackie. You do a good job of that. But when we get back, Brother Parrish and I was talking. Uh, our church has grown, and the uh, dynamic of our church has changed over the years. There's a lot of young people that don't know who we are and how we got here. Uh, we're going to have a, a Sunday morning in the month of October where I bring those two up here, and we're going to dive into the history of how we got here and what God has in us. I think that's going to be a good idea. can't ever know where you're going unless you know where you came from. I think that's important. You ever go to the movies? Got any moviegoers? I have the worst luck of picking a seat in the movies. I'm, I'm, I prefer being in the middle of the row, in the middle aisle. So I can have the focal point, the exact middle of the theater. That's the seat that I want to get. I don't always get that. I will arrive early to get there. But sometimes I have arrived early as, as much as an hour to get to the theaters. So I can have that perfect seat. You're looking at me like, you are weird. I, I, you just know I'm weird. But it's true, it's important. But inevitably this happens. You get there, you make your preparations, you got your popcorn, you got your Coke. You're sitting there in the focal point, the center point of the theater. And all of a sudden someone comes behind you. They also have popcorn and they don't know how to eat quietly. You know, you give the little half turn and the eye roll like, what in the world, you know? Any more than that, you're, you're in danger of a busted lip, you know. Like, and then apparently they have just filled their purse with candy from Walmart. And I don't know why candy has to come in cellophane wrappers. It's the loudest thing that you've ever imagined. All for one M&M. Like, oh my gosh. And you're in the movie and you hear that they're trying to pull it out quietly. But there is no such thing as quietly eating candy in the movies. It's going to make noise. Someone needs to invent something to stop that. And you're trying to focus the movie. I have missed entire movies because it gets my attention. Is anyone else that bothers you? You can't focus if that's going on around. Let's be honest. We're having a help group this morning. You cannot focus if that's happening around you. Is there anybody that said that? I never even noticed that. It doesn't bother me at all. You guys are saints, and I honor you this morning. It's distracting, is it not? Or you remember back in the Stone Age when we were in elementary school, trying to focus on a test. I, I enjoyed tests. I always hated taking, having to write papers, but tests I enjoyed. But you always sat by that one person. You're trying to focus. You're reading. You're going over. You're checking. You're double checking. You're getting you. And you got that one guy just looking there. He's. I'll be honest. That was me. But you're trying to focus. I got a lot of nervous energy. And honestly, they're not trying to be distracting. They're trying to focus. That helps them focus. Trust me. I'm one of these people. I'm always shaking my knee like that, you know, and doing that. It's so distracting. How in the world can I take a test if, if someone is doing that? Or you ever see a basketball game, a college basketball game, and the end zones of the, of the gymnasium is always filled with the student section. Am I right? And the team gets up there, they're trying to focus, and if you... See the rear camera focusing, are they going to make it? All you see is this mass hysteria. People, ah, you know, they're jumping. I know that's a terrible imitation, but that's what they're just going crazy. Why? Because they're trying to distract the shooter from focusing. Distractions. That's what I want to talk about this morning. Life is full 
of distractions. And I gave three examples. There are so much more. There's so many things that distract us in life. There's the cell phone while you're trying to drive. Or while you're trying to listen in church. Some of you are on Facebook right now. That does not offend me at all. But I understand you're, you're doing that. When you're driving, beep, beep, you pick up the phone. It's like you're supposed to focus on the road. Don't look at your phone while you're driving. It's a distraction to keep us from doing what we're supposed to be doing. This morning, I want to talk about distractions in Christ. Things that keep us off focus from living the life and doing what we are supposed to be doing. I'm telling you, there is a destination that God has for us as believers. There's a destination He has for us as Christian Fellowship Church. And I'm going to give you two options this morning. We can live in the land of constantly being distracted and not being able to get to where God wants us to be. Or we can lay those distractions aside and we can jump just head over feet into the destinies of God and forget those other things. There's two distractions that I see that are going to keep us, and man, they just, it's like a prison cell. It keeps us from focusing on what God has for us to do. Over this last year, it's been a long journey as we've traveled through the book of Acts. This morning will be the last, won't be the last sermon I ever preach out of Acts, but it's the concluding sermon in the series on the book of Acts. Acts chapter 28, we see that Paul is on his way to Rome. And it's been a tough journey. Man, they arrested him. He went from Felix to Festus to Agrippa. Given a defense, he finally appealed to Caesar. And he's going to Caesar. And would you believe that he gets shipwrecked? That's what we talked about last week, shipwrecked in life. He's shipwrecked and God saved all their lives and they wash up on this little island called Malta. I'm going to read the first ten verses and then we're going to go back and kind of break it apart. After we were brought safely, we learned that the island was called Malta. The native people showed us unusual kindness for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all because it had begun to rain and was cold. When Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened on his hand. When the native people, anybody in here actually like snakes? Thanks, Devin. Got a couple. I see they're all young. Oh, Mike Muller, thank you. Sarah, okay. I don't think anyone likes a snake hanging off your hand, though. Okay, just check it. I'm sorry, I'm not a snake lover at all. I don't like snakes. The only good snake is a dead snake, in my opinion. I'm sorry. Sorry. See PETA out there with their sons, you know. When the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, No doubt this man is a murderer. Now, I'm going to start preaching if I don't stop here, but that's frustrating to me. If you see somebody who's been bitten by a poisonous snake and it's still on their hand, It's not the time to point and laugh and call names. No one said, hey, bro, are you okay? I mean, that's wonderful. You've been snake bitten. It's hanging off your hand. Nobody says, are you okay? They start calling him names. Thank you. Though he had escaped from the sea, justice has not allowed him to live. Wonderful. Just wonderful. He, however, shook off the creature into the fire and suffered no harm. They were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall dead. Still, how can I help you? I'm going to suck that poison out of your hand. No, hey, I got, a, I got some gauze over here. I can wrap that up. No, they're just sitting there eating popcorn, watching it. Is he going to die? It's wonderful. People are just blessings. They were waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. You remember that movie Pure Luck in the 80s with uh, Martin Short? He got bee stung and he swelled up to like, it was awesome. 
He had waited a long time, and when no misfortune came to him, they changed their minds, and they said he was a god. Okay. Now, in the neighborhood of that place were lands belonging to the chief man of the island named Publius, who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days. It happened that the father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery. And Paul visited him and prayed, and putting his hands on him, he healed him. And when this had taken place, the rest of the people on the island, who also had diseases, came and were cured. And they honored us greatly when we were about to sail. They put on board whatever we needed. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you this morning, Lord, just bring a clarity of, of thought this morning. Lord, silence our spirits this morning where we can hear what it is you have for us to hear. Lord, I believe you've got a mission, you've got a purpose, and you've got a destiny on each one of us individually. And you've got a purpose on us as a church. And Lord, I pray this morning that we would see the distractions for what they are. Distractions. And they're keeping us from fulfilling our purpose. Lord, this morning, I want your will to be done. And I want your kingdom to come. Lord, and I want to decrease and get out of the way and let you just have your way in this place. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Here's Paul. Shipwrecked on an island. I'm telling you, this is a bad day. He's been shipwrecked. He's been on the ship, we know, for 14 days. And all these things, they threw the tackle overboard. They threw the the cargo overboard, and they threw their hope overboard. We talked last week. They ended up throwing their food overboard. And the ship finally breaks apart. But God had spoke to him that not one life will be lost. And it wasn't. And they're sitting out there floating in the water on pieces of driftwood and pieces of the broken ship. And they all wash up on this island, and God kept his word. All of them lived. And they're sitting there, and what's the first thing you got to do? I mean, you've seen Castaway. You know you got to get a fire going. I mean, isn't, is that not right? You got to have heat. You got to have fire to cook stuff. You remember when Tom Hanks made that fire in that movie? And you know, fire, I've made fire. Paul's out there. He's rubbing sticks together. He's trying to build a fire. They've washed up on, a, on an island. And Paul didn't sit around in depression and discouragement thinking, why, oh me, is this happening? He didn't start singing, nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Nobody knows my sorrow. No, he got up on the land. And he said, guys, I'm going to build a fire. And he started picking up sticks. And this snake latches onto his hand. Paul threw it into the fire. I can also tell you, I would have killed the snake as well. Latches on his hand. That is a bad day. To go from in a ship that's being tossed to and fro, to broken up, to sitting on a piece of wood like Leo DiCaprio and Titanic just holding on, don't let go, and they wash up on Malta, and everybody lives, and then he says, I'm going to build a fire, guys, and then a snake latches on to his hand. Anybody ever in that place, you just feel like, God, what gives? Have I done something to offend you? What's the deal with this? What's wrong? Why is all of this happening to me? I can tell you something. If struggles become our focus, then you will spend your entire life living on defense, taking hit after hit after hit after hit. And you'll live in survival mode, and you will never fulfill what God has for you to fulfill in your life. You know what? The great fighters know how to take a hit. It's not how hard they can punch. It's how hard they can take a hit and keep going. Those are the great boxers. 
Those are the great fighters, man. They just get pummeled halfway to death, and they're still standing in there in the ring, you know, the bloody eye, big busted lip, mouth all swelled up, you know, and they're just like this. That's important. It's important that we as Christians learn how to take the hit. And it's also important to not let that become your focus. I'm telling you, church, that's difficult. It's a very, very difficult thing to do. Whenever you're in the middle of a struggle, and man, I'm not on you because I've got my own struggles too. But your struggle cannot become your identity. It can't become your life. There's some of us, we don't even know how to see past our own struggles. It just has hurt so much that that's all that we can see in the face. Just hit after hit after hit. Let me tell you what that is. It's a distraction to keep you from what God has for you in your life. And if we will focus on that, then there will always be a distraction in front of you. That's why things like bitterness and grudges that we hold against people, they might have genuinely hurt you. I'm sure they did. But if you don't let it go, it's a distraction from what God has for you in your life. All these attacks from the evil one. We know he shoots his fiery darts. Disease, offense, unforgiveness, hurt, pain. All of those things are distractions and it's not supposed to become our focus. Notice what Paul did, guys. He took the snake, he shook it into the fire, and he went on about his business. He did not start... Snake Biters Anonymous. I'm going to start a support group in the church for those that's been bitten by snakes. And we're going to focus and look at this suffering hurt for the rest of our lives so we can just stare at it. No, it's a distraction. I'm not against support groups. This is not an anti-support group sermon. But I'm against that becoming your identity. Paul didn't get a shirt that said, I got bit by a snake and all I got was this lousy t-shirt. <laughs> that didn't become his focus. He threw it into the fire and he went on. Notice what else he didn't do. When he's got this snake bite on his hand and people are like, hey, murderer. He didn't say, oh, no, I'm not. I'm Apostle Paul, dude. I am the man of God. How dare you, sir? Who do you think you are? I am called of God. Have you not heard of Damascus Road? That was me, bro. You're talking against the wrong person. How dare you? You know why that's funny? Because that's exactly what we do. We feel like we've got to defend ourselves. Guess what? People are cruel and people are mean. It's what's in the heart of man. But it's up to you if you give them the right to let that be your focus. Let me tell you something. I've been called a lot of names. I've walked through trials, but I refuse for that to be what identifies me. When did we lose the victor mentality and become victims about everything? I just don't think the Christians are supposed to be victims. We are overcomers by the blood of the Lamb. And by the word of our testimony, we're overcomers. We're not victims. I know things happen to you. We were told that in this world you will have troubles. It shouldn't surprise you. What surprises us, though, is when we allow people for that to be what identifies them, and that's all they focus on. Man, there's people that were snake-bitten, metaphorically, 30 years ago, and they're still talking about, oh, that snake bit me. 
They just can't let it go. You know, I'm telling the truth, don't you? <laughs> I got snake bit back in 72. Let me show you the wound. It still hurts. How about receive the healing God has for you and go on? Shake it in the fire. There's still a fire, God, that you can throw that in. It's a distraction. And if you hear anything this morning, those fiery darts of the enemy are not to be our focus. They are distractions that keep us off our purpose. And if you look at the church, especially in America today, a lot of people, they might say the word hypocrisy. Some might say something completely different. Holy art thou. I'll tell you what word I get. Distracted. I remember when Jesus said, The spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to bind up the brokenhearted, to set at liberty those that are held captive. Man, that good news still needs to be preached. You're carriers of the gospel and you're carriers of the fire of God. But we forget that because we keep focusing on the snake bite. Somebody needs to hear this this morning. Throw it in the fire. Take the snake that's attacking you and your family and your church and everything that you're going through. Throw it in the fire and recapture the purpose of God in your life. You don't need a sabbatical. I'm going to take a six-year sabbatical. Can't teach that Sunday school class again. I got snake bit. I'm going to nurse my wound. You don't need to quit. You don't need somebody to come around and look at your bite. What you need is to receive the healing of the Lord and to reach your destiny. It's a distraction. Hope you don't think I'm preaching at you this morning. I'm preaching with you. I get distracted just like you do. Second one is this. Everyone say our sufferings are distractions. Second thing that is distracting is this. Listening to what people say. Starts in kindergarten. Sticks and stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Okay. People talk about people. You ever notice that? People talk about people. Can I tell you what their opinion is? Irrelevant. Brother Richie, so and so doesn't like me. They called me a name. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry you've been called a name at least once in your life. I've been called a lot of names. So was Paul. And I want you to look. Here's why it's irrelevant because people change. Paul got bit by a snake, and instead of offering help, they stood back like they do and called him a name. Murderer! This is one just horrible person. Stay away from Paul, he'll give you cooties. He's a murderer. He's a murderer. He survived shipwreck, and we're standing there in the woods looking at him gathering up sticks. I thought he was going to drown out there. I saw that one wave come over him, and, and that was rough. And then he comes in, a snake gets a hold of him. Stay away from that guy. He's horrible. He's a murderer. I think the appropriate thing, hey, guys, saw you all wash up. Can we help in any way? No. Murderer. Why do people do that? Because people are full of hate and hurt and words. I think it would be really good practice. This is not part of the sermon, but this is free of charge. It would be a great practice in your life and my life if you never uttered one word about a person that you wouldn't say straight to their face in love. Yeah. 
Don't utter one thing about one person that you wouldn't speak to their face in love. That's free of charge. Wouldn't that change the world? No more backbiting, no more name calling. And it happens in the church, guys. That's horrible. That is horrible. Shame on us. Here Paul is. Murderer! And he just ignores the distraction of the enemy and throws the snake in the fire. Just keeps going. Hand didn't swell up. He didn't kill over dead. They're sitting there watching. He's going to die. Just watch any minute now. Nothing happened. And one by one, their opinion changed. And what did they call him? Not, he's not a murderer. He's a god. We have been welcoming gods on Malta today. This guy is awesome. I saw him wash up. This, the wave came over him out there on a the piece of driftwood. I didn't help him or anything, but I saw that come over him. And then I saw him get snake bit. I didn't help him there either, but I just watched. We're waiting for him to die, just waiting. And he didn't die. This guy's a god. People's opinion about you will change. It's not to be our focus. It's a distraction. And you know what? It goes both ways. When they're calling you names and degrading you, it means absolutely nothing. Scott said something to me this last week I appreciated. Was telling him about a phone call I got, and he said, Does that edify you? And I said, No. He said, Then throw it in the trash can. I said, Amen, brother. Hallelujah. Wad it up, throw it right away. That's a good idea. No one's above reproach, uh, reproof. You can always have access to see things, speak that in love. But look how it turned. It meant nothing when they were calling him a name. But when they were exalting, exalting him and singing his praise, guess what that means? Nothing. See, we are emotional roller coasters. When people are against us, we're way down here. They're calling us murderers. It just hurts my feelings. I don't have any friends. There's nobody in that church that likes me. Every time I go in there, they give me the stink eye and the evil eye. They don't care if I live or die. I'm not a person. Okay. I don't know what, what that was. but <laughs> Then you can walk in. Oh, brother, you are my hero. I love you so much. You are the best thing since sliced bread. And I even think you're better than sliced bread. You are amazing. You are a man of God. And I honor you. It'll change tomorrow. That's why we don't live our life based on what people think about us. We don't base our life based upon what people may say. Trust me, I prefer the compliments over the complaints any day of the week. But that's not what gives me my identity. And it shouldn't be what gives any of us our identity. Our identity comes from Christ and in Christ alone. And Paul had the wisdom that if they call me a murderer or if they sing my praises to the high heavens, it means nothing. I'm a man on mission with God. And I'm telling you, that's what's important. Everything else is a distraction. Everything. That's the mission of the church. And actually, when they're up here singing your praises, you better watch out. They either want something, probably want something. And I'll tell you another thing I try to live. This is just a bunch of free advice today. Man, you, this is the best deal in Marshall County today. Here's a good piece of advice, too. If people come to you saying, you know what, Rose here, she's a murderer, watch out. And mark that person because they will speak behind your back just like they did to that person. Mark them and watch out for it. 
No, they're my friend. No, they're gossips. And if they'll do that to somebody else, they'll do it to you. Watch out for them. It's not your identity anyways. But Paul went through the murderer, the God thing. That was a distraction, and he didn't give that any focus whatsoever. Some people been living in the land of, he called me a murderer for 20 years, and it's time to let it go. Your identity is in Christ. So, Richie, what is important? I'm glad you asked that question because that's the thrust of my sermon this morning. Sufferings, distraction. People, distractions. Hurtful words, praise, they're distractions. What should your focus be? Jim Crick gets this. I've heard him say this a thousand times. Focus on lost and hurting people. I'm telling you guys, God has great things in store for Christian Fellowship Church. I want you to look what happens. Paul didn't start Snake Biters Anonymous to nurse his wounds. He didn't start getting his feelings hurt because people called him a murderer. He didn't get exalted when they called him a god. What did he do? He did what he's done all along. Verse 7, in the neighborhood there was a man named Publius. His father was sick with fever and dysentery. Sounds like a rough weekend. Paul visited him and he prayed for him and he put his hands on him and he healed him. And when other people had seen that, the rest of the people on the island who had diseases, and all of them were cured. This isn't Jesus. This is an apostle who received the word of the Lord. But you didn't notice this. This is one of the greatest truths in this story. God used a snake-bitten hand to bring healing to an entire island. Wow, look at that. A snake-bitten hand he used to lay hands on sick people. And every one of them were healed. Well, Richie, I'm not ready for ministry. I'm still hurt. God used a snake-bitten hand to bring healing. And he can use you and your hurt to get to where God wants you to be. He can use you, though people are mocking you. Though people are not encouraging you, discouraging you, tearing you down everywhere you go. God can use that wounded spirit to bring healing to a nation. God can use that hurt, that suffering, that pain, that weakness, that failure that you walk through, and He can bring healing to an entire nation if you refuse to be distracted by it. See, that's the point. And that's why the church in America is so distracted. And people come in the doors of the church, they leave the doors of the church bound up, possessed, Sin, addicted, torn up. When this is supposed to be the river that Brianna was singing about this morning, come and taste and see that the Lord is good. I want people to leave free. I'm tired of nursing demon-possessed people. That's all of us. I'm not calling you demon-possessed. But when the enemy attacks you, I want him gone and defeated. When you get a diagnosis of a disease, I want you to come to the altar and our snake-bitten hands to lay hands on you and say, God sets you free in Jesus' name. That's what I want to see. But the church is so distracted by petty, silly, ridiculous things and we nurse the same spirits for decades over and over and over again. And I'm telling you, spirits, get out in Jesus' name. You don't have to be perfect. You have to be focused and you have to be empowered by the Holy Spirit. Stay focused on what God's called you to do, church, and refuse to be distracted by the ignorant attacks of the evil one. Don't think for a minute that the attacks on your life is by coincidence because it's not. 
He knows when to hit. He knows how hard to hit. And he knows exactly when to strike, to tear you down. His goal is to defeat you. But his greater goal is to keep you from the destinies of God. If he can do that, he can keep a nation in bondage. But if you refuse to give him that access, we can take this nation back for Jesus. We're in trouble. We are in trouble as a nation, guys. We are in trouble as a nation. And it's not getting any better. And I'm not talking about politics. I don't have time to talk about that. I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to lose my lunch. I'm talking about what's the church going to do in spite of it. We live in the land of hurt and distraction when God's called us to purpose and destiny. And it's your choice. Paul could have. He could have sit down. I quit. This day is hard. I quit. I don't deserve this. And I'm not walking one step further. That would have been option number one. I've been there. I've uttered those words. I quit. It's too hard. Guess who wins when that happens? He's won. Or you can say, guys, look at this. Everybody come over here and stare and pet on my snake bite. It hurts so bad. Just like I do anytime I get a hangnail. I need Jenny to love on me. Richie, it's going to be okay. You're going to make it through this. I know, baby. Just pray for me. I wish I was kidding. I'm not. Because I like people to pet on me. I like for people to tell me it's going to be okay. Truthfully, we need to get over it. And we need to learn how to take a punch. And we need to learn how to get rid of those voices that speak in something in your life that God's not saying. And we need to learn how to hold through to the purposes of God. Man, and when you see that, Oh, when you've walked in, you've walked through a bad day, people's cursed you, people's talked about you, you've walked through the fires, and you walk in church and say, I'm here to bring something. I'm here to bring something. Yeah, I've been snake bit this week, but in the name of Jesus, you start laying hands on people in this altar. Oh, man, you watch and see what God will do in Christian Fellowship Church. Whoo. That's what he wants. Stop nursing your hurts. Stop focusing on the distractions. That's not from God. And stop listening to what idiots say. They're irrelevant. They don't get to tell you who you are. You hold on to the focus and the destiny of God on your life. And you bring the power of the Holy Spirit into this building. And everywhere you go, and watch chains start to fall off. Why is America in bondage? Because Christians are distracted. And we've forgotten who we are. And it's time to recapture that. i got to go to Argentina. Father, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we love you. And God, I mean every word that I said today. Lord, every distraction that has come against this church and the people of this church, we're done with it. And we recapture our purpose today. We recapture our power today. And we will stay true to what you've called us to do. And Lord, I believe that this morning, Lord, that chains are going to start falling off, Lord. Lord, I believe healing is going to start coming. Lord, that wasn't just for Paul, that's for us. Why did they see that in the New Testament and not now? Because they were focused and determined and they refused to be distracted by nonsense. Lord, that's what we need, a determination because I believe one thing, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So every chain in this place, Lord, it's going down in the name of Jesus and it will be loosed in the name of Jesus. Because we refuse the distractions of the evil one. 
we will not focus on them any longer. We will throw them in the fire today and we will recapture the destiny of Christian Fellowship Church. Every snake, you're going in the fire today in Jesus' name. Your time is finished. We're not going to look at you one more second. You're done in Jesus' name. Every offense, every struggle, every bit of bitterness, every bit of discouragement, you're gone in the name of Jesus today. Lord, and we receive what you have for us. Lord, because you have good things in store. And Lord, we are ambassadors of the cross. Lord, we are ambassadors of the cross. Lord, so let us stay focused because you've placed us here for such a time as this. And it's time for change to fall off in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Thank you that you've trusted your word and your work to us, Lord. And we repent, Lord, of our distracted nature, Lord. Lord, not just personally, although we do that. By proxy, Lord, we repent as a nation for losing our purpose, Lord, and focusing on the distractions of the evil one. Lord, we recapture our purpose, Lord. Lord, we've got a, just a massive amount, an unlimited resource in the power of the Holy Spirit that's not being used, Lord. Lord, I'm tired of seeing the same spirits, Lord, of seeing the same chains, Lord, when you've called us to cast them down. So, Lord, I call them this morning. Lord, I call the captive to be free in Jesus' name. Lord, I call the captive to be free in Jesus' name. Lord, because the spirit of the sovereign Lord is upon me, is upon us, to set at liberty those who are held captive. Lord, so this morning we demand in the name of Jesus Christ that those chains be gone in Jesus' name. Every captive be gone in Jesus' name. We need a response time this morning. With every head bowed and every eye closed, be honest with yourself and with God this morning. If you would say, Richie, I've been distracted and I've been distracted for a long time. It's either been an offense, I've been hurt, or I've heard the words of someone and I've listened to that. Or I've really been walking through the fire and it's been intense, just like Paul did, over and over and over and it's got my attention. If you're distracted and you want to say, I've been distracted and I, I need to recapture what God's called me to do, just slip your hand up this morning. God will have something for you in this place. Hallelujah. Hands up all in this place today. Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we focus on you. And every hand lifted today, God, I pray right now, Jesus, for a renewal of passion, purpose, and destiny, God, in the name of Jesus. Lord, as they lay the distractions down at your feet, Lord, I pray that you take them and you just re-energize them today, Father, whatever the need is. Lord, if it's a healing, then give a healing. If it's a strength or if it's an encouragement, Lord, all that we have is found in you. And we receive that this morning. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Now I want to ask this question. Still keep your heads bowed if you would. If you would say, Richie, I'm the one that's held captive. And I need freedom this morning. I need the power of Christ to set me free. I'm like those on the island that was held in chains that the word is trying to get to me but I haven't been able to receive it yet and I'm held captive. I'm in bondage this morning and I need to be set free. If that's you, just slip your hand up this morning right now. I believe that's for you too. Hallelujah. I see those hands. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I declare liberty to the captives this morning in the name of Jesus. Lord, not because I'm somebody, I'm a nobody, Lord, but your blood is everything and your power is complete and your victory is totally accomplished, Lord, on the cross. So right now, Lord, we set at liberty those that are held captive this morning, God, in the name of Jesus. 
Lord, the word of God has reached them today. And the power of Christ has set them free. And we know that he who the Son sets free is free indeed. So we declare liberty to the captives this morning, God, in the name of Jesus. Just like Paul on the island of Malta, Father, every person that was in bondage was set free that day. Every one of them. And I pray there won't be a chain left that's taken out of these doors today. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Hallelujah. Grab this word this morning. Refuse to be distracted and grab the purpose of God. We love you guys. Help us celebrate Sister Parrish in the four years. You're dismissed this morning. Continue to pray for Damien and I this week as we're in Argentina. Love you guys. Have a great week.